Okay. So this is delving into what we call chapter two in the manual. And um, I've, you may have heard me mention this at Voices if you were there, um, that one real trick to uh, the manual, which is kind of like trying to read the Rubik's Cube of dense information, um, is uh, to, um, to go to the principal summary at the back of every chapter and read that first. Like the key in is usually the principal summary or the designer's checklist. Not every chapter has them, but this one's the biggest one. Sorry, mate. I didn't get your name and your intro. What was it? Adam. Adam. Well, um, we did a quick, I, I kept seeing you, I'm forgetting to ask you. Did you what, uh, we did a quick intro with everybody else. You must have arrived a little bit late. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I have. Um, so where are you from, Adam? Uh, Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Where? Oh, yeah. Right. One of my directors is near there, Dan Housie. Okay. Southwoods Permaculture. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was looking at um, going to do some trash action. Yeah, good in guy. Kind of <laughs> 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 the big house. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, we did a collab permaculture collaborative. Did a, a weekend workshop there. Built a dam and some swales many years ago. Kicked him off. Is that the one that's the uh, like Savannah Oak land area? Then you're like Prior Lake, like 40 minutes, 45 minutes south, of like Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Prior Lake, that yeah. area. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one I'm thinking of then. Yeah. Prince Town. What's the name of his town nearby? I think it's Prior, Prior Lake. Um, I'm that's not sure it's near there. there. It's near there, yeah. And we asked everybody... I'm supposed to be going there in uh, May, I think. Mm -hmm. why, 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 what brought you to bring a per come to a permaculture course? What are you interested um, in? Well, I already took my first one through uh, Midwest Permaculture with Bill and Becky, Becky Wilson. Um, and I eventually want to get to a teaching certification, so of course you got to knock a couple of these out and learn from a couple of diverse um, teachers and such. So I just came out here for the conference and decided to do this at PDC, just kind of knocking it out as I go along and eventually trying to get the teaching certification. So. Yeah, he's a great teacher, Bill. Yeah, he's yeah. a lot of fun. He's a good yeah. guy. I had the great pleasure of doing a little bit of work with him at uh, Cal Earth last year. Oh, yeah, you were there. Hmm. All right, let's just have a look at this then. Um, Bill's principles, uh, observation. Um, I think the first thing you want to do is observation. Observation first. Um, use protractive and thoughtful observation of natural systems rather than protracted and thoughtless labour. So that's like what I was saying about, particularly uh, in the initial stages in the main framing stuff. Um, and. Um, resource, any energy stored which is cis yield. Uh, you'll find there's a definition of resources in the principal summary as well. So, um, somewhere. Resource categories by use. Ah, uh, yeah. Resource, uh, uh, rules of use of natural resources, reduce waste, hence pollution, thoroughly replace lost minerals, do, a ca do careful energy auditing, and a biosocial impact assessment for long-term uh, effects on society, and act as a buffer or eliminate negative impacts. So, um, yeah, I, I think... Um, the most important one there is the is the energy accounting. Really, that's what we're doing a lot of the time is energy accounting, careful energy accounting. You're making assessments on the the energy audit. Um, so um, any storage that assists yield. The work of a permaculture designer is to maximise useful energy storage in any system, be it house livelihood or urban or rural landscape. Um, what you're actually doing is you're you're, um, you're designing the placement of long-term energy storage elements. So you're looking at how um, um, you're making very careful assessments of how you can store energy within a system, how you can put in long-term um, energy storage 
systems like like very long term trees they they're great energy storage systems um, the problem is the solution is one of the statements you end up at um, we we are the problem, we are the solution. In permaculture, the focus is on turning constraints into resources. Um, I think if there's one last thing you repeat to yourself is um, the, the problem is the solution, the problem is the solution. And you keep saying it to yourself until it becomes obvious. Um, I know I've got to that stage a few times. And that's just like, sometimes it, it's, it's kind of a mystery sitting right in front of you, you can't see. Um, and, um, you, you're often seeing things as like the glass is half empty instead of half full. And you're just not seeing how the, the problem is actually the solution right in front of you. And you can just turn it all upside down. Pollution is an unused resource. If resources are added beyond the capacity of a system to productively use them, the system becomes disorder and goes into chaos. Imbalances may occur as a result. Um, and then there's a quote there about grey water and fertiliser. Um, chaos, you've you really got to understand what chaos is. And um, people analogies are always good. I'm sure you've been in meetings where there's been too many experts and you can't come to a decision. Um, that's uh, when we're oversupplied with uh, resourceful people and we're trying to make a decision. Often then, you know, decisions aren't made, people go into conflict. Um, and um, that's a lot of the time why uh, communities don't work. We don't have enough diversity in the people systems that are in there. And uh, we've got people who are all experts within very similar fields. And then it just becomes chaos. It's just a lot of conflicting energy. Um, so, um, we really have to understand chaos to understand what harmony is. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're opposite. Um, and so um, we want to get the most from our work, to get the most creative and, and productive systems. We've got to push it right to the edge of chaos and then pull back a fraction. One of the problems out there is a lot of what we've been able to affect is so far past the chaos line that to uh, start with systems that are presently in position, they're so extremely large, they're so extremely chaotic that pulling back a little bit is not going to even do much. So to tell someone, right, okay, you've got this completely disordered system your community's too big or your farm's too big and it's massively out of order. It's completely chaotic. You're going to have to come back. You're going to have to retreat back from that size. It may be many, many, many retreats before you get back into a system of order and, and harmony. And that may not be possible for people to, to handle that many retreats back. Um, but when you start from the center and advance outwards, out and out and out until you get to a point of chaos you only have to ret retreat back once that's why bill tells you in the, in the manual start at the, the center of energy and work outwards right don't don't go you know you can you can work out how your designs fits on a large landscape and where the main frames may be in the larger landscape but implement your designs from the inside outwards like extend outwards don't try and grab great big systems. People say, you know, how, do you, how can you convert a great big farm? You know, well, it's almost impossible to start on the large size and come backwards. Um, you just don't know how far back you're going to go. It, it's just too many retreats. But if we, if we try converting the farm from the inside outwards, This is not working, is it? You're not getting it, what I'm saying. I can tell, right? Yeah. You get it? You getting it a little bit? Yeah. Well, I might be wrong on your faces there. All right. Uh, it's like trying to bite into that two pound cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. The, 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 the you know, 
it's really hard to know what to extend on a large system. Right? It's really hard to someone say, pick me a winner that I can extend right out. I think, well, you've got a lot to choose from and you don't necessarily know what the best winner would be. Now, how would you pick it? Well, if you start off in a small garden and you put in a great diversity of stuff, some things indicate quite quickly that they grow without much attention. Um, and they grow, you know, almost on their own. And they can be trialled in a larger system from there. I went, I had to leave my uh, farm where I live now for three years. I went away doing aid work and I didn't come back from 2003 to 2006. Just over three years, I, I left it. I bought the property in 2001, started August 2001. By June the 1st, 2003, I'd put in the initial mainframe in infrastructure. I had gardens and different things and I hadn't put my main crop in. I put in swales and dams and the extension food forest system that I carried with me when I arrived at the farm. <coughs> Potted plants and trees that I had. And I decided I'd better do my last big aid trip and just go from aid job to aid job to aid job for as long as I could hack it, and then I'd have to sort of settle down a bit and, you know, state my case. So I got back June the 1st, 2003. I got back August the 6th, 2006. And the place was in a bit of a mess. And the people who had been looking after it had just done the very basics. My annual garden had gone under a massive amount of weeds. It was two metres high in weeds, as they do. But there was a few things hanging about that were kind of suspiciously abundant. And one of them was gal galangal. Galangal is like a type of ginger. It's a spicy root like ginger. It's a clumping plant. And it's taste in Indonesian cooking. Um, I had three clumps of it in one of my gardens. It had grown on and on. And they were quite big. And there was lots of rhizome underneath. When I dug them up, they, I could divide all these little sections into cuttings and extend them out. And as I then started to put more swales in, I put galangal root divisions out for hundreds and hundreds of meters around swales. Every single one of them's grown into a big clump equal to the one, the ones that are, were, were, were there when I got back three years later. They're $29 a kilo in the health food shop. Uh, organic, of course they're organic. I don't even do anything to them. They're organic on their own. I don't have to try and do anything to them. It was a phase of abundance. I'd have never guessed that. I would, wouldn't have guessed that. That was just an accident. Happy little accident though. And I can share it with other people. I would say, but I spotted it in a small garden. I would never have been able to gamble on it on an extended system. Um, I'm not saying to put in a, a galangal monoculture. I'm just saying it's one of my cash crop in potential. What is it? Sorry? What is it? Thai ginger, isn't it? Yeah, it's like a Thai ginger. Oh. Yeah, it's it's the t if you ever had Indonesian food, it is the taste in Indonesian food. It's in nearly all flavours in Indo Galangal or Galangal. Well, there's two ways people say it. Um, it looks like a, a cardamom ginger as a plant. I know what it is now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you've heard of yerba mate. Yerba mate. Yeah, it's a tree. Right. Um, people have it like a trendy drink. Uh, Argentina. Argentina. Yeah. Often they're drinking it through a silver like straw and a gourd. Yeah. Looks like you're sucking on a bong or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's uh, um, I planted herba mate in my garden before I left because I didn't know how well they grew where I was. I had no idea. I got back three years later and it's taller than this room, and it's got a trunk in it like six inches in diameter, and nothing, I've, no one's been looking after it. So I'm kind of shocked that it's definitely not a tree I need in my garden if it grows that well, but it's, I've got plenty of leaves to process into Herba Mate tea, and it's quite expensive. So I can't have a tree that big in my kitchen garden, in my little kitchen garden at the time. So I. I didn't want to kill it, but I wanted to check it out, so I pruned it very heavily with a chainsaw <laughs> at about this height, just to see whether it would grow back. 
like it would what we call coppice, in other words, grow into a load of sticks. It came back like hairs on a dog's back. It came straight back at me, bang. And it even flowered not long after that and, and produced seed, little red seed, little red berries. I grew some in the nursery, grows easy. And I thought I'd just give it a try as well. And I cut off some heel cuttings and struck them in sharp sand. It grows from a cutting where I am too. Wow. Now, um, I would never have guessed that. I had no idea. I'd seen herba mate when I worked in South America. I'd, I'd seen people drinking it. I hadn't seen the tree, didn't know much about the tree. Give it a bit of a trial. I, would, I, would, I can extend it out, right out through the outer zones of my property, all the way down the swale lines, all out through the food forest, all out down the trackways. I've got herba mate anywhere I like. It's not a problem. I could never have guessed it. But I've got it. And it, it, it can, you know, I can get $40 a kilo for leaves. Nobody in my area grows herba mate. Nobody even grows galangal. Turmeric is another one. Nobody grows turmeric. I can grow turmeric like crazy. I've identified things from the inner zones to extend to the outer zones and to the you know, broader system very easily by just trialing, just trialing and trialing in close right, before I extend out. And it's the same on nearly everything I do. I'll, I'll trial it first. I'll keep it close, keep it in attention then I'll, I'll pay attention to its phases of abundance that I can extend. Right? I, can, I, can, I can grow it out. Now, if it's got great value, but it's extremely difficult to grow, I'll still keep it. But I'll keep it where I can pay attention to it. <coughs> but it's got to be very valuable for me to need to work hard to keep it. Those particular crops didn't have great value to me, but they have value to other people. I mean... I'm never going to grow it. I'm never going to run out of either of those, any of those things. If I wanted to, there's something I could farm very easily. I, uh, just mainly I tell other people. Um, so they become a, um, a system yield. Um, so Bill talks about system yield here. The sum total of surplus energy produced by, stored, conserved, reused or converted by a design. Energy is a surplus once the system itself has available all its needs for growth, reproduction and maintenance. So those elements were no problem to become a, a system yield. They're very, very easy to include as a system yield. I identified them. Uh, so they were a resource that I identified by just paying attention to what was going on. I could have easily have missed them. So uh, they're they're biological resources, living things reproduce and build up their availability over time, assisted by their interaction with each other and compatibility. So um, we've got use and, uh, use and preserve biological intelligence. So what I want to see with those plants is where do they fit, whether those elements fit into a system. Um, and um, if they are they allopathic or do they do uh, do they do something other than just be themselves do they do they make it easier for other plants to grow do they make it hard for other plants to go that's called allopathy um, or can they do something else the galangal is a clumping plant that actually can occupy like an edge space and take out occupy an area that, other, that weeds and plants you don't want want to move in. That area is like the edge of trackways. It can be a border plant. It can be a border to water. It can be a border on the edge, inside edge of a swale right, where water comes up and where the tide line is. That's where I usually plant it. So it has, it, it not only is a resource as a food, but it's a resource as a function as well. You've got to think very naturally about your resources. Resources are, are come in all sorts of forms, and most of our, our resources are living resources. So we need to aim towards the majority of our resources coming from living resources. Right. Um, a lot of the non-living resources that we've got out of the ground, like steel, right, we've probably got enough out of the ground right now mm -hmm. to recycle for a very long time. Um, Living resources self-replicate. So the thing is, 
I remember Bill saying this to me in the P in, to us in the PDC in 83, and from an engineering point of view, I'm thinking, how did that work? You know, if we aim all our resources coming from living resources, aren't we going to exterminate everything and use everything up? But later on, I realised, no, that isn't right. If we, if we aim most of our resources to come from living resources, then we've got to honour living resources, and we have to make sure they're self-replicating and self-extending. So it means we have to really you know, pay attention to our, our natural resources that are around us and make sure they're well managed. There is absolutely no reason that you should have to pay for the materials to buy a house, really, to build a house. We could very easily set up free housing for everybody. Not necessarily labour, you might have to do some barter exchange on labour, but every community could have enough materials to build houses for, us, for ourselves. And that would come from living resources. It would come from, like, there are quite a lot of um, traditional communities in the world that everybody agreed to do one day's work a month in the community forestry. And once you do that, you can, you can build your house when you get married from the forestry materials. Um, if you haven't got one to inherit, let's say. And that's quite easy to do. And we've done it on our farm already. We've planted more trees since we've been there, since 2001, than we need to replace every bit of timber we've used in our development with better timber. And in the next 14 years, we could actually start harvesting if we wanted. So we've gone from low-grade timber we've used and recycled to very high-grade trees standing in the, in the field. That's quite easy to do. And it's been done all kinds of places before. Oxford University in England has every stick of timber sitting in the grounds to replace every stick of timber that's in the buildings. And there's a caveat on every tree. And it's in the historical department. They've already had to log one oak tree to replace giant beams in the library that got dry rot. They thought they were going to have to replace those beams with steel and paint them to look like oak beams, or concrete and paint them to look like oak beams. But they, they discovered the old documents and the oak beams for that section of the, of the university are allocated in an oak tree in the grounds and the caveat to be able to use them is you have to plant four more oak trees and make sure they live to an age where they're, re they're going on in replacement. So you overcompensated and you replant. But you can't cut an oak tree down in England of that size, but because they already had it written into a document, they could. As long as it was for the allocated timber, we could do that on loads of things. Mm. Yeah. So we've done it on our farm already. We've, just, you know, we've done it with better timber than we've got in the building. <coughs> um, one calorie in, one calorie out. I've never heard this one. Where did this come from? The sun runs all life processes. A finite amount of growth can occur in a given season. If we export trees, grass clippings, weeds, animals, cattle and sheep for meat, we are essentially mining our soil and minerals. We need to grow crops to replace the minerals and nutrients exported during harvest. X grow. Sorry? Example. Example, what does that mean? Right. The following things are yeah, grow soil, compost, organic material, uh, learn life cycles of imported materials, and keep as much bias, uh, biomass on site as possible. Yeah, well, one I find mostly we grow people's heads in permaculture. Um, they bring a certain amount of compost with them as the food they're digesting and drop it in our compost toilet. And then they take a little bit of our nutrient away with them in their digestion, but otherwise they go out with heads full of permaculture. Um, if they come back about uh, three years later, we're probably going to feed them with some of the compost that they left behind. Um, but um, yeah, everything's cycling through our systems. Um, There's not a lot of inputs in our system now. Um, we do actually remineralize a certain amount. We bring in some minerals. So we're st still mineralizing our cows' feeds, 
and we mineralise some of our animal feeds, um, which I don't think is a bad thing. Most of it's rock dust minerals and some sea minerals from kelps, and that remineralises our soil still. But I think we'll get to a stage where that's evidence remineralised quite well. So you can use your animals to build up your mineral counts, remineralisation. Um, so energy cycling, uh, yields from a system are designed to supply for on-site needs or needs of the local bioregion. Um, we very rarely sell in an off our site, we just feed our people because we have so many people coming through. Um, and one of the unfortunate things about a demonstration site, this, an education centre in practical sense is that it's highly inefficient in the workers. So, you know, interestingly, when we have six people on an internship, we get more done than when we've got 26, because it's uh, more efficient. Uh, we could probably run a 66 acre farm with two or three people, two and a half to three people would run the place. Um, but we have a lot of students practicing and we have a lot of demonstrations up um, of systems we don't need, we wouldn't have to have, but we do it for the sake of, of demonstration and experience for people. So it's kind of interesting in that, in that regard. Um, but um, on the further extension of that, um, we could probably come up with about seven or eight livings quite easily on our property. So we'd easily have seven people making a living, maybe more on our property. Um, and as an education centre, in its full expression, we'd probably get um, the same livings without any outside influence because the clients would still be um, the uh, students and interns coming through. So on my calculations on our property, we could probably have 50 PDC students and 20 interns running at the same time. That's 70 people on, on site who are actually not residents but coming through the site. So, and then we've got permission to have eight houses on site. One would be an intern house. So we'd have seven households as well on the site. So we're getting up to about 90 people on um, 66 acres. And when you get up to that, someone can make a money, money out of dairy. Um, and um, you know, they're milking and they're making dairy products. And there's an, there's an economy in there. That also means that someone's got to butcher a few calves because they're going to come through. Because um, you don't get milk without calves and calves have to be butchered. And that means somebody's butchering and, and providing meat. Um, you know, there's small animal system. We have quails, pigeons, rabbits, chickens, ducks, as small animals. Um, fish. You so, have fish. Oh, and fish, yeah, we have fish. We have quite a few fish. Um, and, um, and we have goats, cows, we have beef cows and dairy cows. So the beef cows have also got calves. And there's, there's, there's you know, probably a, you know, a butchering process in there as well. Now there's all kinds of things. There's a nursery living on the property. Um, and that's just extending the species that we need and use locally. Um, yeah, there's, 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 there's quite a, a lot in there. Any of you guys keep rabbits? Have some friends that do. Not yet. <laughs> no? Not yet. <laughs> we keep rabbits. We have Flemish whites, quite big rabbits. Yeah, they're incredibly productive. They get pregnant at 11, 12 weeks. So they've got a butcher at about 11 weeks or very carefully separate males and females, brothers and sisters, otherwise they, they breed with each other quickly. Um, surprising. Uh, what about eggs? How many eggs do you get? About 80 a day. 80. But a maximum at the moment. It keeps going up. It's <coughs> like we keep getting more because we keep extending poultry systems. We don't eat our duck eggs much because we've got meat ducks mostly. We haven't got egg laying ducks. 
I've mostly got Muscovies or meat. And they butcher 50 to 100 ducks a year. I recruit my uh, dual purpose tractor birds with the hens and then butcher the roosters. And then our, our food forest birds, I have first cross hybrids for large size. So I just have uh, one large breed of rooster or one or two large breeds of rooster and different large breeds of hens. And when they cross, the first cross gets heaviest first, like quickest. So first cross hybrid of two large birds gives you a meat bird in sometimes 16 weeks, which for farmyard birds is not bad. It used to be 19. I've been coming down a little bit from 19 to 18 to 17, sometimes even 16 weeks. Quite a big bird. That's nothing like the six weeks they get them in factories, of course, now. So you said you have food forest birds and then chicken tractor birds, so two different sorts of birds? Yeah, I have dual purpose chicken tractor in birds, which are mainly like egg layers, but not mad, m bad meat birds after two years, which have to be pressure cooked. Yeah. Right? They're not, they're soup birds, really, because mm -hmm. they're older. And then I have um, a deep litter yard connected to food forest. So a chicken yard that we fill up with mulch really deep and they tractor that, they just manure that and shred it and process it and that gets emptied every 10 days and filled back up again as composting material. But that's connected to food forest range. So they're on a deep, deep litter yard going out. But um, yeah, you have a job to keep up with rabbits as a, um, as a production. You get uh, any predators with that, that amount of animals? Any predators trying to get your animals? Foxes, yeah. But I have a, a dog that's trying to get the fox, so the dog stopped all foxes getting small birds. So uh, chicken tractor birds go in and get shut in at night. They can't get them, but they're inside the electric net anyway, so they probably won't go through the electric net. And then the other birds are, are locked up as well, but that fox will come in the daytime when you've got so much cover and food for us. Although they're inside net and fences, they'll jump the fence. But we've trained the dog to smell the fox, and, and you can do that very easily because we can smell the fox. The humans can smell the fox very easily. If you know what it smells like, someone, someone puts you onto it, you'll know it. It's a musky smell that sort of gives you, a, you get it right here in the fore, in between your eyebrows. You get a funny musky smell. Right, you probably do know it, but some, if no one's told you, you won't realize but a dog gets it like a hit on the head with a hammer so all you need is your puppy dog when they're little it's going to be a, it's got to be a reasonable sized dog eventually right like you just got to wind him up about that smell get this thing get this thing come on come on come on there it goes come on come on go 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 just like you get little dogs onto rats you just get them enthusiastic about that smell and they can tell which way he's going i mean they they smell thousands of times stronger than we do and they, once they know that you really want that thing, you really want that thing, that thing, you've got to get that thing, that's enemy number one. Get that thing. He's probably never going to catch one, but it sure is going to wind it up. You really want to get it. My dog's got one, but it pinned him in the duck pen. Got it inside the duck pen. Got him, got him behind it. Knocked it right off. But that, normally the fox is t too good, too sneaky, too fast. Too what kind of dog do you have? I have a... Uh, uh, Stumpy tail, blue cattle dog, Australian dog. Where are your ducks in the system? If you have the chicken house with the food forest and the egg mobile, where the ducks fit? Are they on the pond? No, the ducks have a spa bath. <laughs> and I've often felt like plumbing in, but it's just a recycled bath, mm -hmm. right? Raised above ground okay. with rock around it. So they're in their own system. They're not attached. Yeah, they, they've got their own deep litter yard. Okay. They've got deep litter, and they've got a pond that they manure yeah. because. Big, especially big ducks like to breed in a pond. We have, we have a pond. Mm -hmm. And then I drain that out so that duck water goes into, in my case, banana circles. I, I drain the pond and the, and, the, and the manured water goes into production systems and they have their own food forest. They can mix with the ducks though, uh, with the chickens. And, and, and you, can, you can raise about six or seven ducks just on the manure of a dairy cow. They'll eat the manure with grain in it and everything in it. They're, they're incredible. If you see what ducks eat, it's quite amazing conversion. You know, all you're doing is converting things. You've just got miracles of conversions. 
when you mm. actually have a look at what a duck does with manure and then creates the beautiful meat of a duck or eggs, it's just a miracle conversion. Chickens will create eggs where there's no calcium. It's alchemy. There's no understanding how they do that. You know, like when you have a look, a, a cow eats 30,000 plants that are inedible to people worldwide. Right around the world, there's 30,000 plants that cows will eat that we can't eat. And they convert that into meat and milk. It's an incredible conversion. It is just a miracle of a conversion. No wonder cows have been a large part of our system. I know there's issues with cows, but they are amazing. That methane, that methane gas digester they've got called a rumen is a miracle. It's an incredible thing. Amazing. The ruminant, you know, it's a phenomenon. And raw milk, I mean, what a, what a thing that is. But um, rabbits convert most of your weeds. When you see what you, eat rab what you feed rabbits, it's most of the weeds in the garden. The things you normally hate in a garden are what rabbits love. I started off with two females and one male, and a year later I butchered 95 and I had 15 breeders. Started with two, <coughs> two breeders. Crazy conversions, like that's all you're doing. You're facilitating these very unusual resources that breed conversion mechanisms. And, and some things are, are, are very extreme, like protein to protein is very easy. So you can turn fish into chickens, through maggots, but you can turn chickens into fish through maggots. You can, you know what I mean, right? Like you can fatten fish on maggots, but you can fa you can fatten chickens on maggots too. <coughs> you can take your dairy cow and shoot her in the in the head in the chicken yard, and feed twenty chickens for three months on that cow. They'll peck all the soft bits off her. They'll They'll eat all the maggots. I know it sounds repulsive, but it's a conversion. And you're getting all those eggs. There'll be a dried up sort of skin sitting there in the yard in the end. They'll get in a ribcage and they'll roost in there and they'll, they'll hatch eggs inside that ribcage and she'll be giving birth to little chickens. <laughs> and it's a complete conversion. But if you take silkworms, eggs, and put them on mulberry leaves, they'll eat white mulberry leaves and become big juicy silkworms. Then you kick the mulberry and drop the silkworms in the pond and you'll feed fish. Now you convert in mulberry leaves into protein. That's clever. That's hard to do. But that's what your American black soldier fly does. So you can convert. So tall Paul, if you were going to do the ultimate conversion, I want the most energy efficient system, it would be the American black soldier fly that, like, that went all around the world after the Second World War. Your troops took it all around the world. Right? So all of a sudden it went everywhere from that. And it's an inoffensive little waspy looking black fly. You wouldn't really notice them. Right? It's like a little uh, slim looking wasp. It has a giant maggot that is oval shaped, kind of like this. If you don't know them, you may have got them in your compost by accident. Kind of like that. It even looks like it's got a little smiley face on the end. Right? It's not a meat maggot that looks like this. It's a big oval maggot. Right? And when it's fully mature, it, it has no mouth and no anus. It can no longer eat and it can no longer poo. Right? And it climbs out of the rotten right vegetable, fruit and vegetable matter, and it tries to find the ground where it pupates and becomes a wasp. Because of that, there are things called a biopod. They're actually made, right? Black soldier fly larvae farm, farm, farms. You just put fruit and veggie scraps in there. When it's rotting, especially in your summer, they might cook and calm down in the winter here. All of a sudden, they'll, they'll appear. They just smell the, the breaking down fruit and vegetable scraps. Then when they're fully mature, they'll try and climb out. And there's a little ramp on the inside. They climb up the ramp, they go out, they find the exit point, drop in down a pipe, go in a pot. You're self-harvesting. It's 38% fat, or 38% protein, 40% fat. It's very high conversion, really high conversion. And they convert organic matter about 10 times faster than compost worms. They're incredible how quick they eat things. 
That's an amazing conversion. Now, actually, I've got that much fat, you have to watch how much you feed to fish because it can give them liver problems. You have to mix it with some carbohydrate. They eat meat scraps too. Yeah, they'll, eat, they'll strip a carcass. No steak. No steak. Yeah. yeah, unusual thing. Cool. Yeah. And there is a liquid that comes out as well that is not a bad liquid I've trialled, like, like, like worm juice from worm farms. This is a conversion. So when you're, you're taking food scraps that are free, almost, like a problem, and you're converting it into chickens or chicken eggs, that's a miracle conversion. Or fish, you know, or whatever. I mean, you know, I, I have my black soldier fly larvae in the food forest with the chickens. And they sure know that that's where they are. Right? So they're waiting for them. They don't, I don't have to have a pot. They don't get very far away from there because the chicken's got them. Uh, it's just the direct feed conversion. Now, this is what we're actually doing a lot of the time. We're, we're just we're facilitating a, 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 a productive ecosystem set of conversions. So it's, it's one calorie in, one calorie out, and you're getting creative about how you end up in the surplus side of that one in, one out. So your, your energy recycling Yields of a system are designed to supply on-site needs or needs of local bioregion. Um, every element supports many functions and every function supports many elements. So every element you choose, you're looking <coughs> at an element. An element is really a plant an animal or a, or a structure <coughs> to cut it to the basics that's what we mean by element it's one of those um, plant, tree, vegetation animal or a structure so everyone needs more than so and we really want to choose things that are um, you'd really like things at minimum three uses so we can get it to do uh, multifunctional things more than one thing so all of these you want to work out its function so every element performs a function and every function is backed up by more than one element so every every element performs more than one function every function <coughs> is backed up by more than one element We're, we're sort of choosing elements now on a criteria. That's how an ecosystem works. An ecosystem, there's no singular jobs out there. A pigeon um, eats seeds in a forest and then flies out and manures that out and extends the forest. But that's not the only thing that extends forest. There's loads of other elements that extend forest. But well, that's not the only thing a pigeon does. A pigeon does do more things than that. Uh, when we're when we're choosing elements, we're, we're looking for you know what functions do they perform, and what other elements back that function up. Right, so we're cross-referencing. It's the way we start to think. 
So uh, every element, um, what we've got written here, how many functions can we get from every element we include in our plans? Choose each element in a system and place it so it performs so many functions, as many functions as possible. Example, a pond provides cooling, supports ducks, fish and aquatic plants, thus creating a richer habitat. It also catches rainfall, which can be used as irrigation, fire protection, or domestic household water. The clay dung dug from a pond can be used for, a build, for building structures uh, such as buildings, walls, benches, ovens, plaster, finishes. A berry hedge serves as food, fence, wildlife, and domestic animal forage, as well as pollen for bees to make honey. So it's just the way we start to think. A lot about, a lot in the design course is actually a way to actually think a way to support design in, in your approach. So, um, and then the next one is how uh, every function is supported by many elements. Planned redundancy will ensure that all important functions will be met despite the failure of one or more elements. It always got a fallback position. Something else is gonna slip in. Especially if you're talking about a really important element like water. Water is gonna be backed up you want water everywhere you can get it, especially as um, climate's getting very, um, sketchy, you get in extremes of climate. Uh, we know that as we take down the ecosystems, the energy is constant, uh, it can't disappear. So you've got the main source of energy is coming from the sun. It gets interrupted by the ecosystems and there's a life storage mechanism. This is the storage mechanism that we're now redesigning for our benefit. But generally out there, those ecosystems are being taken down and the energy's got to go somewhere. And it would seem reasonably obvious to assume the energetic weather we're seeing is that same energy without, without the interrupting mechanism. So what you're getting, no matter what you talk about with climate change or you know climate warming, what you are definitely getting is the wettest day, the windiest day, the hottest day, the coldest day, for that day on record everywhere at once. Some of you already said it. And everywhere you go, people are saying the same thing. Every single place. So we've had the biggest flood, we've had the biggest drought, we've had the hottest day, we've had the coldest day, we've had the windiest day. So what you've got is you've lost the moderator. You've got this climate that's going out of sync. We have had, the earth has been warmer and cooler than it is now. If our, rec, if our, if our data is correct, if the ice core data is correct, we've had sea levels that have been four to six meters higher and 53 meters lower than they are now, if the ice core data is correct. And we think it goes back 500 million years, the ice core does. Uh, we're on a stable plateau. But the next move, if, it, if we go the wrong way, is a vertical slide into an ice age, if the ice core data is correct. And we've got, an, an, and the temperature graph on the ice core data is mirrored by the carbon graph. And now the carbon graph has leapt well in front of the temperature graph. And we can't ever, we can't see that ever occurring in the ice core data, if that's correct. I have to keep saying that because I don't know whether it's correct, but I've seen the graph and it looks pretty scary because that you know you can see this graph that rises to a stable plateau and then dives off and then it repeats that pattern. You, you have to wonder about that one because climate sure will level everything. It really will. And I, I, my belief is if we do the right things, our ecosystems moderate our in, incoming energies and we stay pretty damn stable on that stable plateau. But we could unbalance it, of course. And you're definitely seeing these incredible variations happening. It's like it's, it literally just looks like it's lost its stabilizing element. And everything we look at around us and about ecosystems means it stabilizes things. And that's why we need to work with that system. All right, relative location. You did that, did you? Yeah, you're right. Recognize connections. 
locate elements re uh, relationally maximize relationships among components components placed in a system are viewed <coughs> relatively not in isolation example location of trees comprised windbreaks pond location for cooling fire protection or irrigation um, Oh, I'm rubbing it out. I should leave it in. Now I rub it in. I like to say that um, um, if you look at ecosystems, if you look at those ecosystems, there's some things that are very constant. Um, they're very diverse. Um, there's a lot of diversity in ecosystems. They're not simple systems. Um, there's a lot of connections between elements. Some trees are connected to 500 different elements. Um, and um, nothing lives forever. Evidence goes through cycles of life and death. The system itself exists, but individual elements don't go on indefinitely. But um, so you could say that uh, what what that is is diversity. Um, diversity uh, leads to stability. That uh, that leads to fertility. And that will lead to productivity. by design. <coughs> but that's not perfectly correct. Diversity for diversity's sake is like a collection of trees or a collection of species. A zoo is diverse, but it's not necessarily stable. It can be a very strange collection of species. So interactive diversity is what we want. There's a word missing. Interactive diversity leads to stability. It's the connections we're after. It's the interactivity. That's <coughs> what makes ecosystems stable. And the stability builds that fertility and then by design, we can make that very productive in our favour. We can have surplus productivity. And that is the building blocks of stable community, permanent community, permanence in culture. Without that, you won't have permanence in culture. You can't have, you, you haven't necessarily, you're not building stability in your systems. A lot of elements where um, we're growing out to a certain point and then over a period of time the element is not gaining any extra yield. So there's a point when you don't keep things past a certain point in time. Things grow to maturity, grow to full size, then you harvest. If you just keep overstocking you'll end up with everything being small. Um, and you need to harvest some of the elements out, otherwise they're, they're just overstocked, they won't come to full size. You've got overcrowding. So um, you've got to get a balance between growing things out to a full size, and then you're not keeping like geriatric animals alive in, 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 rather than harvest them just as they get to full size. And it's the same with your crops. You don't let them, you try not to let them go to waste. You try to get them up to full maturity and harvest at the right time. If you're overstocked, you're going to have to use it somewhere else in the system. So all your elements need to be, their needs, to, their needs should be provided from the system. And if you can't use them, they've got to be usable 
by the system. Now the great thing about that chicken tractor on steroids is um, that we've now got for the first time a different harvesting system in our main crop. When we go to harvest in the main crop now, uh, we have a basket and a bucket. The basket is for the crops that we're going to take to the kitchen and the bucket is for the crops that are spoiled, damaged or not quite ripe or overripe because it's easy to get things like zucchinis too ripe. And they go in the bucket and the bucket gets dumped into the chicken tractor compost cage on the way to the kitchen. So, uh, you know, an element that's integral now with our main crop is consuming all the waste crops straight away, immediately. So we're feeding chickens with our inaccuracy of cropping, but that's coming straight back as a compost just a few weeks later. And our eggs, because the basket then, uh, after you've dumped your crop, you leave your, bus your bucket there for the next person to go cropping, and you gather your eggs and put it on top of your vegetables on your basket and walk to the kitchen. That's all. It's, it's, you know, you're stacking functions and providing yields right there, very close cycle. And I've, I've been growing crops quite a long time, and uh, I've been eating my own food for quite a long time, uh, quite a lot of my food. Owen's been there in the early days. We even got a pond named after Owen, Owen's Pond. <laughs> right? Got into it with an excavator. Um, and I've never had this variation. That's a nice little evolution. You know? There are things that may evolve for you and you see these new things come up. Um, stacking, multi-functions of an element, stacking functions, vertical stacking, multi-tiered garden, example trellises, espalier, multi canopies of functional plants. You're looking for stacked elements together. It's like stacking cutlery and plates and bowls in a cupboard by stacking things accurately into productive environments you actually get more in the same space. Permaculture systems are really unusual in space. We, we are time and space stacking and that sounds really sort of cosmic you know you, you're, you're stacking time in the system but you are that's all Fukuoka did you quoted Fukuoka before all he did was stack rice and win a wheat in the same field and overlap the crops and he suspended the germination time of the rice in clay balls but in between less known is the perennial clover that kept flushing between the crop events